microphone is not touch screen. <laughs> okay, so you will not be able to write. I don't know if you were planning to. So, well, thanks much for making the election for for electing to come here today. We have a second group meeting for a week, and uh, Aaron wanted so much to present an update on his research. <laughs> <laughs> so, floor is yours when you are ready. And we, of course, don't have any meetings next Friday because it's a holiday. Holiday? Yes, to Friday. Oh, good Friday. And then Monday is holiday as well. Then you can do that holiday. Wait, Friday and Monday? Yeah. Yeah, so for classes, the schedule is... I plan to distribute uh, printed copies of this. Uh, we should say comments like everything is wrong. <laughs> well, you wouldn't be wrong with that. So, if, is there a note, enough color copies, there are black and white copies? Enough color for everyone? And let me focus it on you and on the screen. No? No, 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 no. And if we don't have anyone on the website, then it's, I mean, not connected to us, and it doesn't matter. Or maybe. Oh, you, you are still recording it. Yes, right? we, we, okay. are, we are recording. Okay. Later, make a movie. Excellent research of Mr. Putin. <laughs> Now you are under the focus. Okay, so I guess, I think last week Dimitri emailed me asking if I'd present something about my results this Friday, and I figured, why not? Plus, you probably didn't trust me to sit down over the weekend and actually write out my results, or try to strategically plan how I was going to write my results. And he's right, I wouldn't trust me either to do that. So it's a good prep work to I'm going to write for the paper. So, Here's what I plan to talk about for most of the presentation, and I'll kind of pick this image apart as we go along, and hopefully by the end it will look less like abstract art and uh, make some sense. So the first thing we're going to look at is ground state electronic structure for the two systems I'm looking at, or the two quantum dots I'm looking at. On the left you can see the intrinsic quantum dot, which is passivated with uh, ligands, and on the right is basically the same quantum dot, except one of the lights is replaced with uh, MN2 dope. And yeah, and it's important to get the ground state so electronic. If we go, so what exactly you're doping here? Like margarines? You, you, you have doping only through the margarines. Yes. And they are substituting lead? Yes, just one. Oh, just one. Just the central one that I. That's boxed out. In the then image. why is it x1 minus x? Um, if it's just one, then the formula is clear, right? Right, I guess I was just using general notation okay. for stoichiometry. Because, well, if you did stoichiometry, it would be but like... What is it? Switch the positions? Otherwise? It, should, it should be... Lead. PV1 minus x? Oh, the, the, the x for small concentration, x close to zero. Yes. So it should be manganese x. Oh, yeah, you're right. PV, yeah. Right, right. Yeah. It should be PV 26 over 27, and then MN1 over 27, whatever those percentages are. You have are. 27 less? Yes. It's actually 26. Oh, and yeah. you may mention literal number of uh, atoms composition. There is nothing shameful to, to tell about it. Okay, so yeah. uh, it should be With that prompt, there's a hundred. Ask the water. How many cesium? How many cesium? Eight? I think eight. Yeah. There's one at the center of each cube. So it's a two by two by two unit cell. So there's eight cesium. Y yeah, the actual, because you, you're not varying the size of the quantum dot, right? Right. They're both the same size. They're both. Yeah, so then you probably really need to present the. Composition? Com actual. Like, 
uh, how many atoms you have in your quantum dot. Okay. So cesium-8, lead-27, manganese, bromium-3 only? All right. That's a stoichiometry. So there would be 54. Yeah, I guess then this like actual size of the quantum dot. Right. Right, because it's not like in a lattice where you just have a unit cell and then it just replicated. Mm -hmm. uh, or, or you can put like a unit cell, but then tell how much it was replicated three times. Two times? Two. Two, two by two. Actually. Yeah, which is awkward, right? So I guess you probably just give the exact number of oh. atoms you have in the cell. Okay. Because it also gives you a good idea of overall how big the system is. Mm -hmm. the, the actual size of your, of your system. Okay, so then. I'm sure someone wrote that down, so I'll remember to include that one day. So. And, and before you go, um, so for, when you show in this uh, octahedral uh, configuration for your mar manganese, uh, manganese 2 plus in a bromium ligand field, right? So first of all, it's completely unclear where is the bromium, where is the ligand. So you probably can use a color scheme, and it's more like for your figures, if, for your paper as well, mm -hmm. right? You probably, maybe in your figures you had this information. Let's say, first of all, I don't understand. There are two different pink colors. Are they just, like in this picture, are they just for fun? Yeah. Or they, well, you have light pink and you have bright pink. <laughs> You're the one pink. I, I do have... On this um, manganese octahedral structure, this one. Yeah. Oh, it's just, it's a lighter. because it's. Ah, okay, so, so this is pink, not really change, uh, the change in uh, um, atoms. So yeah. the, this That's just the software. Okay, um, but this all pink are bromine can, can or come, not? come closer, I want to show something and you to read one word in English. Depth. Depth yeah, Yes, do you know this word? Yes. I know the word separately, but not together. <laughs> what, what does it mean? Depth is... No, no, second word. Oh, queuing? Yes. Um, well, and so if, if you showing the, the it's, say, it's, 3D view or something like that, it, right? it, it makes uh, whatever up front darker, whatever uh, the, uh, in the dusk, whatever mm -hmm. is on the background. And in the representations in VMD, you can click Disable Depth Queuing, and then they do with the same color. But each of these pink are bronze, right? Yes, yeah, they're all the same, okay. same atom. And my understanding, I don't know is it really a point or not, but it looks like it has... It has to be at the hydral environment, right? Uh, yeah, that's what it's placed into. But looks like, again, maybe just the way how you're showing, maybe it's because of the 3D view or something, but it looks like it's not really giving you the nice uh, ideal octahedral structure. You have like these angles being not really 90 degrees. Am I right? Right. So it, it is true. And this is the purpose why you're showing this figure to show that your octahedral is really is perturbed octahedral. It's not. 100% has a uh, pure octahedral structure. Right, because okay. you can kind of even see... Like, well, I kind this, of see, this, but this I was not sure, is it because of the view, right? Because, right. what, music, how do you call it? Uh, the, the depth, depth some Q, 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 Q. Well, anyway, so the three, 3D kind of uh, perspective vision, right? Mm -hmm. When you have what is in front is brighter and larger, and what is going outside is kind of going smaller. And then it's really hard to see whether it's really 90 degrees angles or something else. Mm -hmm. But in your case, and for your results, when you explain in your system, you probably will point out that it's like octahedral, but it's really perturbed octahedral. Right, it takes, well, it looks octahedral, but it looks, but I don't know, explain it. Perturbed octahedral like due to the manganese. If it's lead inside, then it's yeah, all the bond distances real. are relatively the They're same. They're all the same. But when you substitute in by manganese, then you have this... Uh, some contract, some elongate. Some perturbation. Okay. A different environment. So that's what I planned on talking about next. So I just put up bullet points of what I meant, planned to mention in my paper. I didn't put any figures because it would take a long time to go through them all. And I have it laid out as a two by two because for two quantum dots, we do two different sets of calculations for each one. So if we're doing geometry optimization, we do spin restricted calculations for the intrinsic quantum dot. And we do spin polarized for the dope quantum dot because we're dealing with um, transition metals, which can have a variety of different spin configurations. So you have to do spin polarized to get the correct electron configuration. And then once we optimize both of them, we do uh, non-collinear plus 
spin orbit coupling calculate single point calculations to uh, well to include spin orbit coupling effects because both lead and manganese have well lead, lead has a large spin orbit coupling associated with the manganese has a smaller one but it's still there so it, to do accurate modeling of the photophysics you have to include spin orbit coupling so that's why we do single points for both of those and the notable things to mention for both of these systems just starting with the intrinsic spin restricted calculation is it follows a typical electronic structure that's been reported reported in literature where the valence band is made up primarily of bromide four or five p I can't remember up to the four or five p orbitals but the p orbitals and then lead six s orbitals and then in the conduction band the, the band edge is made up of six p orbitals when you can see that from the when you do partial density states or PDOS. So mention that that follows what you'd expect for the system. And there's no trap states, which we'll get to in eventually in a little bit. So you know it's you can trust it to be a reliable ground state optimization for the quantum dot. So there is the absence of trap states is your achievement. For it's, this for that yes. part, yes. So, so the, there there is a high probability of them to appear, but there are some tricks for the system that make uh, but, but absence of go in a previous slide. Like here, there is your trap states, right? Work, work. Those, these are the dope. Or I should have said oh, these, this is these black lines are doping introduced. But if you don't have doping, then the gap is open. You don't have any trap states. Right. And this is because you really have nice ideal passivation. Mm -hmm. It's like a particle in a box. That's where you have the finite potential wells on the edge. So it roughly follows that idea. So electron density is inside the cube. So and then for spin polarized calculations for the doped system, it's, there's a lot going on there because first you have to figure out whether it takes a high or low spin configuration because those are the, kind of the two favorable for MN2 plus and a ligand field. And from our halides generally give a low or they give high spin configuration, so five spin up electrons, which is what we found was the lowest total energy of the system. So and that kind of follows what's been reported in literature when they look at these things experimentally. And then it's kind of complicated because we look at the orbitals, but the orbitals aren't very straightforward to analyze just by looking at them themselves because you have crystal field splitting, which splits the d orbitals of the manganese ion. And then there's also there also appears to be some distortion of the geometry, so it's not perfect octahedral. It's more of like a square pyramidal structure. Because if you look at this bond here, like it's like 0.8 angstroms longer than all the other ones, and it's more bonded to a lead that's out here than it is to the manganese. So it seems like there's some sort of Jan Teller distortion. So it's not just because usually it's a very common distortion when you have octahedral structure, right? And then the bond on an epical or whatever you call it on a top and bottom, from mm -hmm. like you have four atoms lying on a, on a surface, right? And then top and bottom ions, uh, they are either longer than the bonds which are for your uh, four guys which are in the surface, or shorter, right? Mm -hmm. So you either squeeze it or how say elongate it. And then it's also known there are some uh, uh, simple, from the simple geometrical point of view, uh, how to call it, uh, molecular orbital theory gives you the splitting between your D uh, levels based on this perturbation. Mm -hmm. But in your case, your perturbation is really just kind of one bond is increased on a surface. I mean, those four which are laying on the surface. It follows. Follows the trend you said. So within like a plane, they all kind of have the same bond distances. And then this one. I so my understanding is this four, they are all on the same. No, no. Uh, this four, which are, which are this cross. Uh, I don't know. This guy, this guy, that one, that one. No, no. This is, I guess, top and bottom, right? Uh, no, actually, it's uh, in the here. So these cross four are in the same plane. I saw them. Horizontal two is supposed to be long. If you come closer, you will see. I thought like this four stay on one plane, and this two are kind of outside the plane, right? Or not? 
would be. I don't know, it makes more sense to me if you viewed <coughs> this and this. Oh, I like see. Outside is the point. So, so, you, so, <laughs> so you may need additional labels if you want to show and discuss. So this yeah. is your plane. Yes. Okay. Yeah. That's what I'm describing as the square. And then all four then atoms still are at the same bond distances, which are in the plane. Yes, they're all roughly like 2.7. And those which are outside the plane? This one's longer and I think this one's a little shorter. Huh. So little you, you have top and bottom not symmetric. Wow, okay, it's interesting. interesting. Because usually they go both shorter or both longer. Mm -hmm. I think. I'm still trying to figure out exactly why it is. I well, check your symmetry, and you can also just Google. It's very easy to Google something like uh, perturbed octahedral structure or something, and mm -hmm. you will find some kind of splitting in levels how it was, uh, how they estimated just based on a simple simple geometry kind of point of view. If you have squeezed octahedral or elongated octahedral, mm -hmm. how you have your dx dy orbitals are splitting, and maybe you will see very similar splitting for your uh, for your predictions. Yeah, that, I that did splitting is based on the ligand uh, um, electronegativity. If you have more electron donating ligands, you already have this change yeah. in your length due mm -hmm. to this electronegativity yeah. effect. Yeah, but my point is that how this because uh, in a pure octahedral you will have three D and then two D, right? But if you have this structure, when you have either I don't remember exactly how it splits. But if you have either squeezed or elongated, mm -hmm. it right? goes like two one one. Right. Mm -hmm. Then, then you yeah you will have two one and two. That's more what like I that. see for the d orbitals. Or okay, the so you checked it already. Uh, I've started to. I can't have to redo some of them, but okay. But I yeah, think I do again, see the orbital ordering, and it it's pretty consistent with what you'd expect. Okay. The but of the but then maybe just again illustrative, maybe to put it in your figure, if you show in this kind of uh, structure, right? You probably also can show your splitting in levels as it is expected from the symmetry and then when you will be discussing your density of states and showing exactly how the splitting goes you can refer to this uh, expected kind of uh, qualitatively expected uh, picture in your d orbitals and whether you see this or not with your spin orbit or without spin orbit uh, interaction and so on yeah that makes sense it's just i haven't processed all I, of it and it's kind of I, i'm trying to find the best way to illustrate it too because there's also, the well, the illustration is really just how many is two, one, two, or whatever your splitting is, uh, and maybe it's, don't forget to cite the source where you're taking the splitting from. Right. It is known as John Taylor distortion. So uh, John my name is so Taylor sorry. distortion can be applied to everything. It's not just for the ah. specific. For oh. uh, yeah. Okay. I, I guess. Probably. I mean, this many is many kind of distortions yeah. has pretty much the same name. Yeah, I guess the same guy was studying many distortions, not just no, this one. No, two guys, John and Taylor. John oh, Taylor. oh, okay, yeah, maybe, maybe John some... Taylor is something more special. Okay. <laughs> maybe, yeah, but no. Taylor, Taylor distortion is also <coughs> distortion is very common for many other types of distortion. Yeah. Mm -hmm. But this is for elongation. Mm -hmm. Just distortion and variability. Mm -hmm. mm -hmm. mm -hmm. oh, okay, so then. Yeah, last point I was going to make is the. I don't know what that is. No, doesn't anything. It looks like a touch screen, but it is not. So you get the level splitting just from the symmetry, but I also see hybridization of the d orbitals with the bromides, and even hybridization of these with themselves. So it's kind of, kind of have to sort through all of that mess to, to nail down what's actually happening in the system. Aaron, mm -hmm. um, do you plan to cover the following question later, or you are going to planning to skip it? The choice of uh, charge and multiplicity. Oh, is it charged? Oxidation and uh, uh, multiplicity. Is it like singlet, non-singlet? But uh, do you plan to talk on it later, or you want to skip it today? Uh, I was thinking maybe once I got to. A couple more slides. Okay. Bring it up. Well, at least. And your system is it charged or it's, it's neutral? Charge. 
Because yeah. it was like this. Well, because your beacons are charged. Yes. Because the crystal structure itself isn't charged, because it's unless there's some sort of agency or something. But but yeah, the crystal structure itself is charge neutral. But which beacons addition. again you use? The we'll get back to that point. That's gonna be okay. slides. So Okay, that was spin restricted, spin polarized. So then we do single point with spin orbit coupling. And what I plan to do is note typical uh, half EV reduction in the band gap due to a splitting of P orbitals from the blood. Mm -hmm. Splits the spin states. Which you do the spin coupling. Spin orbit coupling. Spin orbit coupling. Mm -hmm. yeah. and, then, and it reduced the band gap by about 0.5 EV, which has been reported by other people. And then I was going to do a P-dose analysis because of spin orbit coupling, you get the uh, you know, best way I can do is mixing of states because that's what spin orbit does. It takes, I guess for this system, I'm not quite sure. It, would make it, much it takes your S or P and, uh, and mix them. Yeah, yes. so they're more hybridized, so it's so more you, complex. Your S and P not uh, any more good uh, quantum numbers. Mm -hmm. uh, means your L actually, right? Your, L and S, uh, so it's J. Uh, quantum numbers, yeah. yeah. L and J not really good quantum numbers in this case. So be interesting just to compare the orbital analysis for homo and homo for mm -hmm. both systems. And then also compare spectra because uh, there could be changes in oscillator strings too if there's changes in the orbitals for all the states. And then for the dope system with non-collinear and spin orbit coupling, same thing, PDOS analysis, seeing how the orbitals change with the inclusion of spin orbit and building the spectra, and then we're able to see uh, DD transitions or spin flip transitions from the metal dopant, and then note the intensity of it. It's there, but it's very, very small. Very. So, next thing we add to our figure is we did our electronic structure. Now we're going to look at the role that ligands can play in introducing states within the band gap are surface trap states, which is usually reported, or, which is one thing that's been called in the literature. And the expectation is that for the intrinsic dots, you can have ligands either oscillate with the bonds, and then you can see changes in oscillator strengths just due to bond vibrations, or they could even pop off during molecular dynamics. So if they pop off, or if there are any changes in oscillator strengths, you should be able to see that along your trajectory. But do they? Hmm? In your results, when you run uh, dynamics, uh, your ligands are going out? Uh, we don't see any pop off. Ah. We'll get to that in a second. Okay. So and then hypothetically, it can pop off. Mm -hmm. so and, and generally, in arbitrary quantum dot surface, you may expect that popping up of ligand will result in creation of trapping state. Yes, which, was, which is bad because it reduces PL. And that's, well, that's so what these quantum dots are used for. Is so you recognize possibility of this adverse effect and giving us heads up that this uh, effect should be taken care of. Yes. Okay. Just setting the stage for results seen later. And the idea is that in a dope system, like even if fuel ligands or server states are created, like it shouldn't, the dopant doesn't care because it's protected on the inside. So these, its d orbital states are not going to be interfered with. So, the first thing to think about is if the ligands are going to pop off, it's like they'd have to have a pretty low binding energy. So, a natural thing would be just to look at binding energies of the ligands to the cross quantum dot surface. And this top image up here just shows spaces on the quantum dot that I removed ligands from. So, just looking at this top surface, altered it a little bit, and you can see it took a one of the acid groups off from the leads from the central most because uh, it's kind of by its, it's least affected by other ligands, so you can get a better idea of just removing that ligand without any correlation effects from other ligands. And then I also just removed a, a mean that's adjacent to it, that's covering one of the faces. Just a second, I'm lost. It could be, it could be worse to show your inset, this plane. As a standalone uh, image for the whole slide, maybe even from different aspects, and discuss it in more details because but spatial uh, understanding is, is very but important. Before you go, uh, this is your first paper on this type of system. 
you were not publishing anything before with the same events with this quantum with this uh, pale sky dots we did a thin film and it was it wasn't a me but it was Okay, but, but again, your story about the legal. So first of all, you try and, um, I'm, I'm lost in a sense, like what exactly you expecting? You, you're trying to say that depending on a position, depending on the surface and position of these ligands, they, you expect them to interact differently with the surface, right? Right. I just want to and look at it And some of them will be stronger and some will be weaker, right? Yes. And you are calculating binding energy of these ligands? Or you popping it out and looking whether you create a trap states? Eventually, yes. So here we're just looking at binding energies to see if. So again, like you, if ligands can pop up. Right, you're looking on a binding energy for specific like two or like you're not really going through each ligand, right? right. How many of them you have? Uh, you take really the most representative ones right. on that surface, on, and you, you you have some reason why to look just on this or just to, to that. Mm -hmm. And then compare the energy interaction uh, with the surface, uh, well, just calculating binding energy. Yeah. Means you take it out, find the energy, optimize, mm -hmm. after you take out the ligand. Not the quantum dot yet. So this is, this no, is just like binding a energy. If I didn't relax the surface of the top, is that what you mean by optimization? Well. You've got binding energy by definition. This is a difference in energy of the system with this attached group comparing to the energy of individual group and the system without that. But they all have to be in their relaxed form, in their minimum energy form, right? So if, you, if, so you if you're not optimizing the surface... It is a rough approximation. Like if you do frozen binding energy, it is not quite binding energy. Right. It is a rough, rough approximation to the binding energy. So I'm not saying these are the true binding energy. I'm saying these are rough estimates that are probably o are overestimated to what the actual ones would be. We don't know. It can be underestimated. It can be overestimated. Because when you take this ligand out, the energy might grow or might go down. We don't know. True. Be because your binding right. energy telling you whether it's really energetically favorable to be with this attached group or not. Or not, right? Means when you not put in this group, maybe the energy would be low. Mm -hmm. uh, Aaron, so before you go into, maybe you are planning to jump quickly to the next slide, but before you focus on more details on this slide, on removing ligands, can you make a comment how the ligands were deposited? What is a pattern of setting ligand, uh, the right ligands of different nature, anions and cations, and how do you decide where to, to put anion, where to put cation, and in which uh, stoichiometry, how many And your anions not compensating for cations? Like you still will have a charge on the, on the, on the quantum dot? For this one, yes. Because we have 54 carbonic acids and 48 amines. So it's not one for one. Can you, can you so, tell, tell more about it? Yeah, then it's really interesting why, why you doing this so, in this proportion. So we just looked at the oxidation states for both, both for lead and then the charge of bromine by itself. Uh -huh. the, so lead has a positive charge, so if you wanted to bind something, you would two, positive two positive charges. So you'd want something with at least two negative charges, or at least a negative charge, or something that could donate electrons, density mm -hmm. basically. And then for the bromines, they're negatively charged oxidation states, so you want something positive to bind to those. So we have our acids, these little red guys, they're coordinated to surface leads. And then the amines, they'll either be coordinated to over bromines, or they're also, the way that the perovskite structure is by itself, you just consider bulk. On the faces, you have your bromines and your leads, but then in the centers, there's you basically just need an atom to put outward pressure to keep the cell from collapsing in on itself. So that's what the cesiums are. They're basically putting an outward pressure for the cell. Mm -hmm. And since there's an outward pressure, if we just if you have like a finite dot and you didn't have any charge, like 
say, over here, there's going to be a net outward pressure going this way. So you place it in me and over the face, and that kind of pushes the, like that, those plaintiff atoms to keep them stable. So we can have ligands on there to passivate surface atoms, and it also has like a, a pressure to keep the post structure optimized. Or pressure will probably stable. lattice constraint, maybe not not really pressure. Yeah, it's more of a strain. I don't know. I would say lattice constraint due to this uh, additional mm -hmm. atoms, mm -hmm. which make this really constraint kind of thing on the lattice. Mm -hmm. I don't know. It's I don't know, pressure is an intuitive idea to me anyway. But, That's why I say pressure. But there's yeah, but when you say problem. pressure, especially when you say like when you synthesize, it's not gas, it's everyone, not gas everyone imagines that you really press your uh, system when you're doing your synthesis. Mm -hmm. But this is not what you mean. Right, it's like an electrostatic pressure force. Right. So I would say it's probably better to use uh, lattice constraint or something like that. Yeah. So uh, how come that one needs dual type of uh, ligands? No, but he, he just explained. He said we have bromines which have negative sign. Okay. And, so and cadmiums, oh, yes. let's which are positive. So th this is a um, common sense argument. But uh, is it the only common sense design for you in your computational modeling or you based on some literature reading and uh, experimental experience? How this idea was developed? Uh, I've never done it myself, but I'm pretty sure if you just put uh, the oleic acids in, or the carboxylic acids in, if you tried to synthesize it, it probably wouldn't work. So that's one reason why you need both of them. I think another reason is so if you in just synthesis, use... synthesis, you need both from the Yeah, because I think... I had a straight earlier, now I can't remember. Basically, citation to experiment to support this hypothesis necessity. Mm -hmm. You also have to consider maybe you just put the acids in. I know. I guess they're pronated when they go in, so they don't need charge balancing. Um, yeah, with acids, it's salt. another thing. Are they protonated or deprotonated? What's going on? With so the when they go, listen. So it's a lake acid. Is we, it would you like to criticize or add some ideas? All right, I'll do. She, she may, but maybe she is uh, hesitant. In her uh, research that she, she was showing, mm -hmm. she does have deprotonated acid, mm -hmm. and then the proton uh, from acid goes to metal on the surface, like cadmium sulfide. Sulfide, but cadmium sulfide. But this is not happens with uh, carboxylic. No, but uh, in, there was an analogy. So. Uh, when deprotonated and proton stays on the on the dot, there is also proton is uh, cation and uh, acid is uh, anion. They can also do some sort of movement. Just a proton? Yeah. Well, in this case, proton probably would not work, but it is a simplest possible uh, cationic ligand. Well, in other words, what's happening with your protons? So you, you start with acid, right? And right. acid means you will have uh, wherever you are, lake or uh, carboxylate, uh, carbo carboxylic acid. It look more like this guy. Yeah, you will have H. And then this H is dissociating somewhere to the solution probably, right? But but kind of what, what really happened in there? How you know that it should be in a deprotonated form? Um, because things don't like to exist with charges. So eventually, like, if you have a ligand that pops off, like we took this ligand, pulled him off, and he was just in solution, like this, like. Then it's really proton in the right away, right? Yeah, it's, it's gonna take a proton from somewhere. And it couldn't even take a proton from this amine over here. Because there's gonna be a bunch of those hanging out in the solvents here, too. Um, can I keep asking? Uh, so that we will not feel before London comes. <laughs> Uh, is there any connection to ethyl ammonium acetate as a chemical compound? It is a possible configuration that could happen if these two ligands interact. 
in the solvent. But um, how do, does a thevamonium acetate exist in nature? Can you purchase it from Sigma algae? Can you write it? Can you perform it? It is there. It is there. Uh, above his uh, words, salvation shell. So when uh, the, the... I thought that was ethyl ammonium acetate. Yes. Ethyl ammonium acetate. I may mispronounce it. I think you, I think you said it different. Maybe not. I don't know. Okay. But yeah, if you arranged... So if you took this amine and placed it more towards uh -huh. the, the acid here, it's like they'd be charge stabilized. Okay, so they'd be attracted by the charges. So in, in some sense you can tell that you uh, passivate your quantum dot with a ammonium acetate, but while passivating the surface it dissociates. That could happen, it's a possibility. But are you really starting with this compound or you really start with two different uh, solvents, compounds, whatever? What does experiment mean? Yes. yes so, they would, so, they would, so they start as charge neutral. So they start in this configuration. There's oleic as acid and then oleolamine. As, as okay. two compounds, as right? Two compounds. Not as... Uh, right. They're, they're introduced into the batch separately. Okay. Oh, from this different is, syringes. Yes. This is, and, and then wherever the reaction happens, they might react with each other, right? right. They might react with the surface through the losing protons or whatever and passivating with your cation and ion ligands, right? Mm -hmm. And it would play a role in binding energy because like, if it's more, sp if the acid, if it likes being bonded to another amine more than it likes being to the surface, like then that's going to induce it to come off the surface. Yeah. And I guess your calculations, if you're not optimizing the structure, probably not really showing the real right. picture which one is more stable. I haven't yet. Stable. It's Work in progress. I would I would just have a suggestion because you have really, I mean, like it's 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 a very inter interesting and important story by itself. What's happening with the ligands on the surface, right? Mm -hmm. uh, you probably can really do these calculations and really prepare these things as additional paper, just focusing on the ligands thing mm -hmm. and how they uh, affect the surface, wherever they are binding energy and so on. And here probably just go through just kind of. Mainly, mainly discussing your model based on your uh, experimental kind of analysis or whatever experimental setup, trying to convince everyone that oh, here is a here is what we assume is the most uh, reasonable model, and not really focusing on the question which one is more stable or which one is less stable and so on, because technically you really don't have a good set of data to to say which to, to really conclude that this is a more stable structure or not, right? right? And if, if, since you will be, like, I guess, you're still doing this calculation optimizing or you can run it anytime, uh, if reviewer will ask it, you can, you probably will get more data by that time, right? After, after, uh, after, because it probably takes about one month to get the review uh, answers back. Mm -hmm. And then, then you will have probably more, how to say, more rigorous calculations for really proving that yes, your statement is now proved. Mm -hmm. And if no one will care about it, then you know, you, so like you probably can can make a separate paper on role of ligands. Mm -hmm. yeah. it seems because like otherwise, it looks like you have two. Like this question is really complicated and not as easy to proceed, right? Just for understanding the overall idea, how you were doing it, and why you're making the statements. So if you're really going in a lot of details, just towards this ligand thing, I guess it puts really your focus far from from your manganese, uh, whatever, doping contribution. Mm -hmm. Yeah, if, you see, if the slide seems awkward, it's because it kind of is, because I made my presentation. I mean, I would say I, you need, like, Dimitris, kind of, if you followed his questions, how exactly or why you're choosing these ligands, why this is a uh, kind of this ratio of these cations, uh, anions, right? If you're just describing your model, through through some supporting uh, citing experimental work and just give an overall common sense why you think it has to be this way rather than the other way. I guess this just goes not even to the discussion, but just when you're explaining your model, right? Right. And That's then right. you're not really using these things for any any discussion of results for effect of ligands. 
because here is a model, right or wrong, but this is what we have. And you have a good reasoning why you were constructing your model this way with these ligands. And then your main question would be focused on the ligand effect, right? Oh, ligand effect, sorry, uh, okay. doping effect. Mm -hmm. And then you just go, no doping, here is my electronic structure, the gap is open and ligands contribute or not. We will discuss it probably in your next slide, right? And then when you have a doping, then here is a fact, and then the importance of the introducing the spin orbit, the spin polarized, blah, 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 this kind of things, right? Mm -hmm. So I would say you probably really move this discussion from discussion to the model, uh, building or how we call constructing the model. You can put a problem, I usually put it in a methodology part, or you can start your discussion with your model explanation or whatever, model introduction. Mm -hmm. Um, but not really go in uh, details with uh, binding energies, which one is more stable or less stable. Okay, so yeah, just highlights. Or the thing I just wanted to highlight for the slide was binding energies are on the order of EVs, which, so much which, higher than KT. So which we again cannot really trust. <laughs> um, can I interrupt you before you go forward? Well, this uh, first figure is very important, and can I show something here and ask you a comment on this? So if you have stoichiometry of so many cesium, so many lead, so many bromine, so many of uh, each ligand, how to balance the charge to have it nearly zero? Need four more <laughs> equations? Huh? Need four more equations? But um, what what are the numbers, and do you believe that you have uh, closed the balance of charges of each uh, ion close to zero? Um, if I do my mental math, eight, fifty-four. But but does it follow your scheme of ligands? I guess you're trying to ask this, right? Well, Can you just use this number of ligands which you use on the uh, opposition? Instead of, right now there is no time for you to uh, make this math on, on, uh, on the fly. You can just generally tell that there are anions and cations, both from uh, core of quantum dot and, and, and from, uh, from the ligand shell. And total number of, of charges, of positive and negative charges, should be should total to, to zero. Or Close, close, to zero. To, close to zero, and it is one of the principles of how to deposit ligands. Deposit them in such proportion that total charge will be zero, if, if it is true. Mm -hmm. That makes sense. I didn't make the model, so I can't really <laughs> comment but on how you, it was made. You need to pretend that you made the model. You, well, you, you, need, you <laughs> need to justify that the structure which you're showing, right, is really reasonable. I can't say it came in a dream. <laughs> <laughs> no. As a, as a period I mean, you, you, you can say it, but I guess <laughs> this, will not, this will be not counted as a dream. After, after you publish, and journalists will start hunting and asking why you can answer this way. <laughs> I guess I missed the point. So, why is the legal is only one to one ratio? Um, This equation? <laughs> <laughs> you can bring to, cool, cool. to balance the charge, I guess, right? Or maybe write it on the whiteboard. Oh, yeah. We have a whiteboard. You, you, you do. You can show it here. Yeah. It's okay. I think whiteboard will work for everyone. I think so Braden is in online. He is seeing us, but we are not hearing him. Braden or Braden? No, Braden. Braden is on the online? Yeah. <coughs> Oh, no, yeah, I guess he would. Then why we cannot hear? I don't know. He just texts us. Oh, he said, like, he can hear? Yeah. Nice. Okay. Say hi to him. Well, if, if you say hi to him out loud, he probably hear it. Yeah. yeah. <laughs> so. Based on stoichiometry, like these are pretty much fixed. So far, two by two cell. Plus eight. Plus eight. Two by twenty seven. Minus fifty four. So that's eight. And then 
So then basically you just have to do like find a good ratio of those two between the ligands to minimize that number. Yeah, I see point. So the cross guide itself is neutral, right? Yes. And your ligand is one class and one minus. Uh, periodic crystal, three-dimensional crystal, is, is neutral. But yeah, if, if you cut surfaces, you can get uh, excess of uh, anions or excess of cations. The, the idea is that his number of positive lands, negative bromines, right, and positive uh, uh, CS, what is it? C C C C C C C uh, they are not uh, really equal to each other because of this reason. When you cut from the surface, you may have surface enhanced by cations or enriched, enriched by cations or by uh, anions. So basically all the bromides or halides that would be popping out of the surface aren't there anymore. And they're replaced by Wiggins. Uh, Alisa probably can comment on it like when she, well, you, you were not really making your quantum dots, right? But you remember uh, Levi was making it from you, for you taking it from a bulk, yeah. that sulfide, right? Yeah. And you remember like one surface is having just sulfur on the top, another surface having only selenium on the top. And if you have stoichiometric ratio of cadmiums and seleniums, Sulfur one to one, then yeah, everything is balanced. You have no no charge. But if you cut so that like those which is if you have a surface with sulfur and then you cut the other surface which also sulfur, possible, right? Then you will have actually extra sulfur on the surface, and it would be charged with positively charged or backward. Mm -hmm. The surface is stimulated by cadmium, leaving both of them on the top and bottom. Then you have more positive charge rather than negative charge. And this charge can be balanced by cation or anion beacons. Yes. And in your case, it looks like you have not the same, not stoichiometric number, means not exactly the same number of uh, positively charged lead and uh, cesiums versus negatively charged bromines. Mm -hmm. That's why he needs this balancing it by beacons. So. Yeah, I think we were tired of the last slide, so I moved on. <laughs> <laughs> so, so here we look at the actual molecular dynamic trajectory for both of these systems. And so for the intrinsic quantum dot, oh, I should mention that both of these, they're computed with either spin-restricted or spin-polarized calculations. So the intrinsic quantum dot, from looking at the cone-shab orbital fluctuation charts shown here, so basically all the little colors represent uh, orbitals and then their fluctuations in energy and time just from the uh, following potential energy services. Uh, I j just kind of a comment on the word. I, I think intrinsic looks a little bit strange because you also have intrinsic properties of your dot case, right? I would suggest maybe instead of in, in, intrinsic quantum dot, call it um, uh, pure or pristine and dot. Pristine and versus dot, something like this. Probably it makes a little bit better sense than intrinsic. But again, intrinsic, why well, you cannot have intrinsic dot quantum? Yeah, I guess. No, I guess just on terminology. Mm -hmm. I don't know. I don't know. I've been using intrinsic for like six months now. I, so I know, but, so but did you get it from some other papers <laughs> or mm -hmm. it was your own word? I think. I think Dimitri said it once, and then we just kind of stuck with it. So Again, it's open you, to re it can be revised. If you talked about like semiconductors, right? Bulk semiconductor doped versus usually they call mm -hmm. pristine versus doped versus doped, or just call semiconductor versus doped semiconductor. Mm -hmm. so, yeah, intrinsic, but intrinsic, it is in the community of uh, um, engineers and technology when one speaks about uh, bulk semiconductor. Okay, so but maybe in Kaluida it would be not as. Uh, I would suggest standard. use it pristine. <laughs> the same thing. Pristine, and then it, it broke it. <laughs> 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 well, whatever, just, just a comment. Okay. So, yeah, so these fluctuation charts, you see that along the trajectory, that there are states that kind of go lower than where the orbital started out at, and those are usually indications of trap states. Well, for me, they'd be indications of trap states that occur during the trajectory. So just to illustrate the point more clearly, I took a time step, which is illustrated around this black box. I took the position file from there and just did a single point calculation. You can see that there's a little, mm -hmm. little hump inside the gap. 
you can attribute that to, to uh, certain states. But did you check it? I didn't. Well, if you took already the uh, slice, uh, how say the snapshot of, at this specific time, right? Mm -hmm. You can you can look on your orbitals and really see where this uh, thing is localized. Is it localized on the ligands? I mean, I could do that, but then I run into the danger of well, it's spin restricted, but then the system's really spin orbit, so I feel like uh, I'd be provoking. But here, here spin. So this is spin restricted calculation. And then I was going to mention that. But 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 your spin restricted is needed only when you have your Marvin. Is when you have a pristine and a quantum dots. It's probably not so much important, right? Uh, mm -hmm. but there the PV there are people in community who would not agree with this. So Can but you, your calculation showing if you have spin restricted versus non -spin, rest spin restricted for the pristine quantum dot, you see a big difference. The the band gap, which is so in the conduction band, that's where the like the band edge is the p orbital which sees the half energy splitting. So there's potential for this part to be covered up by the uh, spin state. Uh -huh. I guess. So then your spin is actually really important even when you don't have uh, uh, d uh, orbitals from Marvin. Ideally, one should do everything with spin orbital. Oh, because you have lead and yes, bromine, yes, that's why. Yes. Okay. Especially if, if it is already possible, if it was shown possible, then uh, it is more correct scientific method less danger to be hit by all the years. But your dynamics is done without. It's been a restricted case, right? Right. Uh, and then the oh, which, which, which dynamics? Molecular dynamics. Molecular dynamics. This or, is what or, he's or, or, or couplings or electronics. No, 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 just this picture which he's showing adiabatic molecular dynamics, right? Yeah, well, we can do, we can skate by on that because. The forces on the atoms aren't going to change drastically between spin orbit and spin restricted. So your electronic structure is going to be not the same if you did spin orbit, but you'd expect the... But, but again, it's not, it, it costs you nothing really to look on, because you already have your dots showing. Uh, take a look on the uh, actual distribution of orbitals for this specific state, right, which is inside. Uh, doesn't matter what, because you because of the same reason you said like oh we're not expecting that uh, motion of ions will be affected by the, by the spin case right mm -hmm. it's only electronic structure which is affected right. but it's really you think in its motion of atoms which cause the state kind of being special being really inside the gap this one because yeah I would expect that because it happens at some special moments right. Mm -hmm. Some the gap is opening and then it's closing, open and closing at some moment. I just times. chose this point because it's obvious that this right, is right, right. So that's why like nothing runs and really like again it probably goes to supplemental. It's not your main point, but definitely would be since you call it trap state. Yeah, characterize it, it shows that it's localized because maybe it's still spread over the entire system, and if it's spread always, there is no localization, and whatever the reason makes this gap going down, who knows. Then uh, you can call it a trap state. Did you watch right. the movie of interatomic distances? Is it uh, because of is it when it when your molecule is disattached? Pop popping up? None of them popped up. But okay, I've but then it's probably really localization on uh, maybe some side of the quantum dot, or maybe on the ligand. Yeah, I think it's just due to if you consider like the surface is just a bunch of harmonic oscillators of the okay. PV and uh -huh. ligand. If you have enough of them in phase that are a certain distance away. Like you'll have less covalent bonding, but they're still ionically, so it's... <laughs> anyway, Some that point that? in there. I mean, I could do a whole study on this, because I Just look on the localization delocalization, like, is it really localized or not? Well, we could just do, just uh, do oscillator strings, and that would kind of give an idea, because homo lumo... Well, it, is, it is interesting to see, uh, well, I mean, oscillator strings is next level, but on the very basic level, correlation between uh, uh, geometry, at, at, at this time uh, slice and uh, localization, spatial localization of orbitals. Mm -hmm. Just do projected, uh, how it calls, uh, projected charge. P, P charge. Part charge. Yeah, part charge. Part charge. Yeah. Yeah. Uh, files for actually just for this state. Mm -hmm. and, and maybe you can do it for the case when your gap is open and the case when your gap is closed, just two structures. Mm -hmm. And you suppose that those where your gap is open, your whatever it is, uh, it's unoccupied state, right? Your luma would be spread over the quantum dot, right? or maybe it will be inside the core. I don't know, but it will be spread. 
will be delocalized. And if you look on this case when your gap is closing, you're expecting that your charge density will be probably sitting maybe on one surface or maybe just on a ligand. It would have some localization. Mm -hmm. Yeah, I get what you're saying. So then, I guess we kind of covered the point about average lead oxygen bond length during the trajectory. I have this Excel file to do, I just haven't gone through and processed the data yet. But, I think but analysis, really analysis of this bond telling you that it's not really broken, like you always have a covalent bond during the dynamics. Right, but you should be able to see like a range of distances that it covers in some way they'd be able to correlate the range to mm -hmm. electronic structure. And then, oh, and also another relevant point is for about, we did spin orbit oscillator strengths for about like 50 time steps. So you can track the oscillator strength and time along the trajectory. And we saw that there was a definite phase, or it definitely oscillates. And I don't know if I had to guess. Well, so it doesn't fluctuate abruptly, but it is fluctuates continuously? Well, not well, continuously. Oscillates continuously? Well, not totally. But it's having some phase. But, yeah, means. you can see that there's some sort of oscillation. Phase. It's not perfect, but and what's the, what's the period of this oscillation? Does it match any of the normal, normal mode? Yeah, that's what I was. Well, that's what I was hoping to compare with uh, this data up here. Okay, because well, it seems obvious that this should be correlated to the this bond distance. But you know what uh, Levi was doing with this kind of things. So and he has a script, so you can probably just contact him and ask whether he can share the script. He he was sharing with Javit, right? For, mm -hmm. for his analysis of the oscillations in the bond distance. I did not take this one yet. But anyway, you can, you can ask him. But he was just calculating, let's say, uh, he was actually decompose his distances, like all uh, coordinates, like each distance between neighboring atoms, let's say, ligands, whatever it is, oxygen and lead, oxygen and, uh, uh, so your oxygen's only connected to lead, nothing to the uh, CS? Right, all the oxygens are two lots. Okay. Anyway, so but you 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 can uh, you can uh, just look this um, oscillations do the Fourier transform. Actually, I think he was doing after correlation function first, and then he was making a Fourier transform from after correlation function. To get the spectral. And then yeah, yeah, which gives you some kind of uh, frequencies, right? Mm -hmm. uh, which would correspond to the normal modes, uh, either acoustic or um, what was uh, optical modes, right? Collective motion. Uh, which will be really related to this uh, lead or oscillations, right? Mm -hmm. uh, and also, you probably can find in the literature this lead oxygen normal modes, modes <laughs> for, for the surfaces or something. Mm -hmm. But you can actually do it in between, like you can do it for each pair of atoms, right? Uh, wherever they interacting, or wherever the nearest atoms you have, right? So you can actually do this procedure for uh, wherever you are, uh, lead brom bonds right and see what in other words you can kind of get the spectra any right uh, any near, nearest nearest neighboring atoms which give you some idea of the normal modes uh, some of them might be really harmonic some even non-harmonicity will be present through this method right uh, which kind of give you the whole spectra of your vibrations which you have for the system would definitely be handy. And because you can you can decompose it on each uh, type of atoms, right, or type of bonds, you will clearly see kind of this connection with uh, going to to a uh, question from Dmitry. Um, does this oscillation, which you already see that you you have some oscillation in the electronic levels, does this really relates to the normal ones? Mm -hmm. Or let's say to this specific frequency correlated with this frequency typical for that or or maybe lead bromine or maybe even cesium lead even if they're not really creating a bond right but they do some kind of motion which might be involved into the vibration mm -hmm. vibrational mode i think that's how i plan well it's basically the same idea how i plan to process the data because in an excel spreadsheet you can just choose nearest neighbors by just taking the shortest magnitude yeah. the distance and, then, uh, and, then and, and, and again yeah you, you can you can take the this and period. just to Fourier transform directly from the bond distance but I think then you probably will have a lot of noise. Uh, and that's why you probably can ask uh, Levi. I think he was doing first, you find it, but you can do the same getting the after correlation function between each neighbor, uh, between each near, nearest neighbor, right? And then do Fourier transform from the after correlation function. 
uh, which I think he was doing it for the purpose to get rid of a lot of noise and your spectra becoming much more smooth and nice and with very clear peaks. I'll have to talk to him when I Yeah, see just send email to him, ask. So that's the intrinsic dot, and with the dope system, it's not as interesting. So, so we did spin polarized, so we have two different energy fluctuations. So you have your spin alpha, where those are where all the up spin states are from the manganese, and then these two states here that are kind of separate from everything else are 2D states, or dehybridized or whatever. So they're from the manganese. And you can see that along the trajectory, there's no states that pop up in between them. So surface states don't affect there. And then spin beta, that's where all the valent or unoccupied D states are, where the transitions would come from. So like the first five, they're not very spaced out from the perovskite quantum conduction bands, but you can kind of resolve them if you look close enough. And then you don't see any trap states that poke through those either. So, so along the trajectory, they're unaffected by trap states. And then if you looked at the home or oscillator strength from spinner orbitals during the trajectory, they're basically constant, but they're just very low, which kind of follows our expectation from the beginning. The dopamine being unaffected, or the oscillator strength being unaffected by trap states. And then and also another awesome possible idea for, probably for the future, is like the possibility of dynamics of the ligand field along the trajectory, because as mentioned earlier, there's one bond that's a little longer than others, so perhaps at a high enough temperature, it would be convinced to come in and it would kick another out so you have some sort of dynamic ligand field going on. But it would be interesting to look at. I don't know if it actually happens or not. But anyway, so next slide. So now we're going on to non-radiative relaxation of our excited states. So we have a photo excitation, which is an illustrator that comes in, creates an electron and hole pair that uh, behave independently from each other. And so you excite near the edge of the band gap? Or how, how far away you excite? Is it hot excitation? It means you're really deep inside the valence and conduction band, or you're close to the edge of the valence and conduction um, It's pretty close. I can't, I'm used to just seeing orbital levels, so not, so I don't know what the energy difference is. But you know, even. you know energy while you excite. You, so know, I know you should know your initial conditions, right? Yeah, those are, based exactly on excite. those are just based on orbital numbers, and I'm not quite sure what the range is off the top of my head. So like, you, you're not controlling you, the energy of the excitation? Well, you can, you can tell uh, roughly, are you exciting uh, a little bit above the gap or like to the three gaps? A little above the gap, so it's like within an electron hole of the gap, basically. Mm -hmm. And uh, what, what is the gap and what is the like half electron volt above the gap? Which color or which uh, transition energy you just probably need roughly to, you probably need to show your spectra first if, and it has yeah, to be before it has going to be to spectra rotation, yes. averaged over room because your dynamics is at room temperature right if you take a spectra at some specific snapshots it's not very representative right you need to have like you mm -hmm. can average right. your spectra over how many steps along trajectory mm -hmm. and then it would be really average over ensemble mm -hmm. because at room temperature it should be really present over all possible configurations, right? Mm -hmm. So you average your spectra, and then probably looking on your spectra, you can say, oh, I'm exciting at this first optically active peak, which is kind of close to the band gap, whatever it is, in the range of one electron volt, or whatever your energy for, for this excitation, right? Mm -hmm. And that's why I, look, I basically, my initial conditions are based off oscillator strengths. So that's what I'm dealing <laughs> with instead of the energy. But you probably also set up the energy. Because you're assuming, like, if you shine light by laser, this is typical conditions for the uh, lab uh, experiments, mm -hmm. right? You're usually not using white source of light. You use a laser with some specified wavelengths. Mm -hmm. And then you're really exciting at specific energy. So, right? And you're probably holding this energy mm -hmm. around. Not exactly, probably, wherever it is, 1.5 electron. So, do, do not panic, do not worry. There is no right or wrong frequency, just be specific. So like we are exciting at if you pur show your purple absorption, or whatever. Yeah, if you show, start with your absorption spectra, as I said, like averaged over how many configurations. Uh, if you average over all configurations, I think you just will see very broad. Actually, is it discrete? 
Do you have confinement effect on the spectra or not? What kind of spectra you expect? With some peaks or you really having just like from bulk like this? It, it is your chance to go to a blackboard and draw a spectrum. But maybe he has a spectrum. No. No, the past grounds. That, that would have been ground state. And I just I just put bullet points there. So like okay, if I did spectra it would have been in this is. in part of the slides. <laughs> okay. But can can you can you just roughly draw it on the blackboard? <laughs> Just schematic. Something like because it was a kind of uh, surprise for 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 Jeb, but when he was uh, looking on the spectrum of his uh, two-dimensional uh, flakes or uh, how you call it, plates. Something like so. You really have nice separated peaks here. Depending on the broadening that we use. Reasonable so broadening, but like the. What, uh, can, but this can is you label temperature. The, the this axis? is already this is uh, at zero Kelvin or when you have this is zero K. Zero so K. From geometry okay. I guess when you do it at room temperature, of course, you will have much, much bigger broadening for your. I got a separated peak like this one in the end at, point. Here. At zero K. Yeah. No, no, no. At three hundred. Oh. And L symmetry. Oh, because now we have this yeah. L, which is much more distinct from the. So, uh, how, can you show how the um, bulk should look like if you take a spectrum of bulk per sky? Very roughly, very roughly. Yeah, probably growing, right? Okay, growing. okay. Growing with uh, exponential kind of curve. Okay. It's and not exponential, how we call it? Square, or square, square. Uh, square. Um, Right. And uh, the first can peak, the gap, can, can you right. label the approximate energy of the first peak for quantum dust? For realistic ones or mine? For yours. Mine? Right. Nice. Video question? Uh, just put numbers on the x-axis. Ah. The energy? Okay. I can't see. What is it? Here. Two point four eight so green. But this is is a race with experimental? Yeah, just by accident. Because <laughs> <laughs> we use PVE for the band gap, so it's about half lower than it should be. PVE? Functional? PVE functional. So that underestimates by about half. So the real band gap should be round three, I think. The system because it's a small dot, so you expect it to follow the whatever the quantum but, but is. So the, the confinement size, effect should be much smaller. But, but, but yeah. the size is uh, your quantum is much smaller compared to the um, what you really synthesize, right? Right, so it should be a big blue shift for this one, and that's why they come agree with your two point two. And it just happens to be a okay. 0.5 dB plus. So again, if you look at on your spectra, it looks like you excited the very first peak or the second peak, which is kind of more intensive. Uh, second and third. So that's usually if we're looking at. Well, so that looks like it's deep enough, like you really go into the high excited state. Second, I, I would say kind of intermediate, because your first one probably go, goes from the, from the from the Homa Luma. Yeah, I think with this one, it would be much easier to understand, for, at least at zero Kelvin, right? But I would say, mm -hmm. to be more accurate, uh, to specify your initial conditions, you can uh, take your spectra at room temperature average over your ensemble, and then hopefully you still will be resolving the three peaks, but they will be more broader, mm -hmm. and maybe shifted a little bit to, I would say they probably will be shifted to red more, compared to your zero Kelvin calculations. No, be because looking on this one, what, what your orbitals do, they... Oh, they I usually see, right. go down in energy rather than up. I guess, yeah. So in average, you probably will have smaller gaps than you have at zero Kelvin. How do I get back on this one? Okay. And <laughs> just very quickly, uh, when you do your calculations, are you including spin orbit or not in this case? Uh, that one. Or you can do both. You can do both. That one's spin restricted. Is there another color? Maybe do. If you do uh, spin orbit, like this one actually increases a little bit, and then it follows. Well, your, your first peak increasing in intensity. Yeah, right? by about four times.
Then it follows the same trend after that. So yeah, non-radiative relaxation. So, so the way that can be modeled is the perovskite is still going to be absorber, so the excitation is going to be on the perovskite, so it's going to relax to the band edges of the perovskite. And then it's going, and then from the perovskite, the electron and hole can relax to the dopant states on the inside of the gap, and it's going to happen at some rate, which ideally you'd like them to be at the same rate, because otherwise, like, you'll have a hole waiting for the electron, and where it could be emitting, it wouldn't. So ideally you'd like for the rates to both to reach the manganese states at the same time. So I haven't fully completed these yet because working out some bugs with the code and the data. But for we just start with our intrinsic dot, comparing spin restricted, spin polarized on radio relaxation. They both relax to the band edges of the quantum dot at about 10 to the 1 picosecond time scales. Uh, I guess I'm not sure how that compares to the literature off the top of my head. I can't remember what the reported values are. Let's look at that. Spinner, not any bad couplings for the intrinsic dots. It's work in progress. So it's a sub picosecond range, right? Yes. I think my initial data showed that they're about on the same time scale, but it's I don't fully trust it yet. <laughs> so and then with the dope dot, that's where the interesting non radiative relaxation occurs. So if we just do spin polarized calculation, so there's no spin flip, we see it's much the same, right? They're actually a little bit different. So they show a little different relaxations, even though the energies of the bands are about the same. I know, it's kind of weird. So for the spin polarized, if you excite a hole into the valence band, about 20 states, so that's going to be on the perovskite. And then the population is going to decay. You can see that these little things going up, that means that states are gaining concentration. And then when they decrease, they're losing populations of states below them. You see that happens pretty fast in the conduction band. And then even once it hits the dopant states, which are close to the band edge, it's like, it takes a little bit of time, but after about 300 time steps, all of them relax to the band edge. But for the spinner, not your bad couplings are, if you include spin orbit coupling, we see the populate homo minus 20, which is in the prostate band again, ideally. So it decays, you kind of see some quick relaxation from the perovskite bands, they're a little slower. If, you, if, you, if you're looking closely, you can kind of look at the time steps. But there's not much of a difference here. The big difference is once you get to like homo minus three, homo minus two, there's a big pile up. I guess you could say a population that occurs at homo minus one, and then it just takes, there's, it's just a very slow. So it looks like you have some intermediate, um, let's say. <laughs> Intermediate state. Intermediate state right. comparing to you. But uh, is, is it legitimate to compare alpha component and spin orbit? Maybe it reflects the spin flip dynamics and you need to have both alpha and beta in your spin polarized and still your uh, spin polarized will has no chance for spin flip. So it can be uh, evidence of spin flip transition. So you're saying like this? A state where you have this bump corresponds to the spin flip? Could be. It, it's not enough data to to tell it 100%, but when, when should it suspect it? Hmm. And spin flip is always slower than all other processes, so that it may happen later. So you can get spin flips for non radiative? Yes. Yes. Uh, if you are in the basis on uh, spinners, there's so you allowed. You allowed. Actually, right. for for the non, uh, actually, it's not. It, it's it can be not really slow. Well, uh, it is a re is reason why you may crossing. want yes, why, why you may want to track the magnetization as function of time. Mm. Okay. So if if there are no spin flips, then overall magnetization will stay constant. But if you have spin flips, it may just like the oh. mm. change change again. So I get what you're saying, but I guess from I don't have a good picture in here of it. So basically, homo minus one and homo of the, uh, of the 
the spin alpha is base. They're basically the same in energy. If you look at the dose, mm -hmm. is the spinner. So, and it's the same energy outset too between the states. So it's not an energy issue. It's so you, you want to say that homo and homo minus one in spinners have primarily alpha character. Yes. Mm -hmm. So they're not contribute contributed by beta. Right. Mm -hmm. That's why it's going to be a spin. Like yeah, that's. So you have. That's why I didn't consider it anyway. And if you look at the the red field tensors, mm -hmm. like the magnitude of the spinner transitions is about half of the uh, spin polarized. Mm -hmm. Which I'm not really sure why that is, because. Yeah. Th then it would be interesting again to understand the nature of this uh, intermediate luma luma minus one or whatever homo minus one state. Mm -hmm. Why is it so different from your? But if, if you make comparison between spin polarized and spinner, and uh, you're not showing beta component, then you need a very strong argument. Well, well his argument because the energy is so... Oh, it's on, on, the, on the for frontier orbitals, for mm -hmm. close to home, but when you excite to the home oh, minus 20, there will be switching. counterpart of, of, the, of the different spin projection. It could be, but the beta, well, the ones I ran, the betas, they relax in like 10 to the minus 2 degrees. So those happen very quickly. And it's... Um, and it doesn't go, the beta state is not uh, they don't enter, have entering the uh, depth. Right. So it, it, it stops much at a different energy. Mm -hmm. Well, it is not seen from, from this figure. If you just add this explanation, uh, it, it could be fine. But uh, the audience not always consists of mind readers. Yeah, I guess. Well, I think someone said this was going to be a brief meeting, so I tried to. Thank you for making it. How many slides do you still have? Uh, two more, because we're done with non radiated now, so we go to radio. <laughs> so one slide per 15 minutes, we are kind of on a schedule. <laughs> so, let's get out of this. But anyway, so, so now we're looking at radiative relaxations that can happen in these systems. So. Non radiatively, the holes and the electrons relax to the band edges of the dopant illustrated here. But you can also have PL that comes intrinsic from the perovskite, because in experiment they do see dual emission mm -hmm. from the same samples. But, but in our systems, our dots are so small that you don't see the same characteristics from just one dot, so we made two. So you could compare the PL from intrinsic or pristine dot in the dopant. And you know this in this notation here. This is just something that's I guess conventional in coordination chemistry for describing transitions from these states. Can you teach us a little bit more about this notation? So T means triple degeneracy, or yes, triplet uh -huh. for short. And then the upper script describes the multiplicity. Uh -huh. So this would be three spin-up electrons. Okay. And I forget what the subscript is. I guess something to do with the symmetry. Mm -hmm. But that's not the important thing. So we go from a triplet state to a singly degenerate state that has five spin ups. So basically, this is just a fancy lab code way of saying spin flip transition. Okay. And what letter A stands for? Symmetry. Our A is, it tells you the degeneracy of the state. So it's singly. This is this notation should uh, should correspond to the symmetry of your state, mm -hmm. and it's it's either a or gerade, angerade, I guess. Well, that's what the subscript is usually, isn't it? I thought the letters just describe your orbital or the energy states well, you're looking at. Well, next time we may just show the uh, photocopy from inorganic textbook. Oh, atomic. Uh, atomic spectroscopy, my work as well. So, and yeah, these are best visualized, or best described as images rather than, than words. So, if we look just at our pristine or intrinsic dots, spin restricted calculations, so we see we excite right away, and then as it relaxes to the band edges, that's what happens during this time. 
down here, you can get possible intraband transitions or luminescence from like LUMO plus 10 to LUMO plus 8 or something. So that's what these describe. And then at about one picosecond, the electron hole relax to the band edges, and that's when you get your homo-lumo transitions. And then this figure here basically says that the interband transition into these transitions here are have higher oscillator strengths, are brighter than the homo-lumo transition for the quantum dial, which is interesting. But so basically, it relaxes here for ten hundred picoseconds first radiative lifetime, and then we can see the peak here which is just summing up each emission. And the intensity comes out about 10 to the third units. But when you compare that to the spinner, it's, the interbrain tra transitions aren't as bright, and the brightest one is the homo lumo. And it's not shown on here, but the intensity of this one's up to 10 to the fourth intensity. So it's about four times more intense, which <coughs> kind of corresponds to our spectra because of the Homo lumo peak is about four times higher, so you get four times more intense PL. I'm just wondering one thing: the intensity unit is atomic unit or just arbitrary unit? Uh, it's just arbitrary. Uh, I think when I put it, I put arbitrary, just because I didn't know what else to put. I'm not sure if it's atomic. I think it would just be arbitrary because it's just counting, or it takes an emission from one time step and just keeps adding them. I'm not sure what units there. So it's not, not normalized. It's just integra right. integrated emission without specific units. Mm -hmm. It's used only to compare relative intensity of peaks. Yes, and that's why when we make, that's one reason we make two dots, so we can compare them. And then I didn't do the spin polarized PL yet, just because I don't have an infinite amount of time. I'll get to it eventually, but then the drum roll, the finale that we've been waiting for, PL from the dopant, is very small, about it's 10 to the five times smaller than the intrinsic quantum, or pristine quantum dot. And our working theory right now is we're not getting good emission from our DD transition. One, it's because our simulations kind of cut out at a certain time, so you're not getting the full ready to lifetime. So the speed could be a little bit higher. But don't you say, I remember for your poster, you were, your, one of the main results was that uh, you will have this emission from this state only if you include spin orbitals. Yes. And this is with spin orbitals. This one here is spin orbitals. So it is but small, even small but not zero. If you don't have spin orbits, then it's completely done. Right. And then if you have spin, spin orbits, then you have weak. Mm -hmm. Because the latest so and it should be, yes. I was going to say, so an experiment, they see that this peak here is, should be the same order of magnitude as this peak. But in experiments, they probably don't have a single mang manganese uh, impurity. Uh, the doping sure. constant, well, for one dot, it's pretty small. Small, so but still probably not a single manganese. Yeah, that's yeah. true. But I mean, well, even and if then, you had 100 and then again, though, you will, you, each of them, like you will have, each of them contribute in these D levels. Of course, mm -hmm. they might be split due to the interaction between these impurities, right? Mm -hmm. And this will increase your intensity. So that could account for maybe one order of magnitude. We still have another three or four. But you more. said it's not. Uh, f order. You said it's just four times smaller. Four it, times? No, no, no he so four, four orders. Oh, four orders of. So if you look at the scale, this is ten to the minus one. This is 10 to the fourth, 10 to the fifth okay. scale. So, so it's, it's four orders of magnitude. Mm -hmm. Yeah, probably then it's cannot be the reason for, uh, yeah, because you expect that your impurity should be maybe 1% or something like that. Mm -hmm. Not more than 10% for sure. Maybe, maybe not more than 3%. The experiments I've seen, it's pretty low, but there have been. But low, just, usually it goes from 1 to 5%. Mm -hmm. This is what they call low. So, so even without, without doing uh, literal calculation, you kind of know that the DD transition peak will be missed when it's been polarized. Yes, because uh, yeah, one reason I haven't done it is because. But, but, but it, for someone who, who looks 
quick, so it will be very illustrative to show mm -hmm. that it is literally blank of this uh, transition energy. Mm -hmm. nothing. And I think you have a better, better figures in your poster for, for illustrating this reason, this observation. I think in your poster. Oh, you my mean, orbital. No, not orbital. You were showing your emission spectra kind of whisk in orbit and without. Oh, right. Then it's clearly showing no peak. Mm -hmm. <laughs> uh, a couple of questions. Um, your intrinsic spin polarized, um, time dependent luminescence, and you have a bracket telling Homo Luma transition. Mm -hmm. Is it possible to make zoom in into the vicinity of this transition? Like literally here? Huh? Literally here, or just figured? No, not right now, but in 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 the, in the future to zoom in uh, in energy from maybe two point nine to three point five, and in time from maybe one picosecond to ten picoseconds to show, because right now it is almost invisible for human eye to show that this uh, mm -hmm. feature does exist. Just make it as like an inset. Yes, inset to sound convincing for a reader. Mm -hmm. It was not a question, it was a comment. <laughs> and for the uh, same region in the spinner co-creation? This guy? Yeah, like uh, I can't even see it. Oh, for intrinsic. Intrinsic. Oh, intrinsic. intrinsic and spinner. Yes, here. here. This uh, orange stripe ends at uh, around 15 picosecond. Yeah. Um, okay. Is there a way to... Uh, Continue it. Is it on, on, on the way? It's with maybe frozen propagation. Yeah, it's a work in progress. Okay, because this is artificial. This cutoff here, like mm -hmm. radiative lifetime should be longer, but it's just a a bug of our code right okay. now. Okay. And if you if you do this um, frozen propagation, if you fix this bug for DD transition, do you expect it to be a little more intense? Uh, we may get up to point two. Okay. Okay, better. W will it be bigger than the infrared transition, at least? Uh, yeah, I okay. have been able to just uh, setting my initial conditions as homo lumo. Mm -hmm. like, it does get bigger than uh, these intraband transitions, just not much bigger. Okay. And now we're back to where we started. <laughs> <laughs> so it means we are done? Well, have I gotten applause yet? <laughs> sure. <laughs> Questions? I think we asked them all. <laughs> uh, maybe not everyone. Anyone wants to? Uh, please, Aaron, with more questions. <laughs> uh, I, I had a question. No, no, no. The, the EA, that just mean your ethyl acetate? Yes, okay. our ethyl ammonia. It's just shorthand I use. It. I would change it for the paper. More questions? On once. Uh, on question once. one, question two, question three. Okay, let's uh, upload Aaron once again. So if you were writing intense and extensive comments, you may submit it then back to Aaron so that he will uh, improve presentation. I saw some notes on there. So see you next time yeah. at multiple locations, but specifically on Tuesday meeting, right? When uh, everyone will uh, hopefully bring results section for the papers. This will be the hardest part for uh, editing and helping each other.